Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us here at Willard School. I'd like to call this meeting of the Board of Education uh, to order. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start our evening today with uh, a student presentation from the Emma Hart Willard School. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Correa, Dr. Correa, excuse me. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Willard. Um, tonight we have a special presentation for you regarding math. So we'll, we're going to begin. The best part about tonight is that we have several students here to interact with our board and to work with you all tonight. Um, our board members are going to be partnering with our students, so get ready. We have a fun, fun evening for you. So, Mrs. Watson, if you want to grab that real quick. We are just going to turn the board slightly so you can see it. Um, we're good except for Tim. Okay. Okay. joining us tonight for a mathematical experience. Mrs. Blackman and I have been talking a lot about math this year. Part of our initiative for our district is that we are working with a group that is implementing Math Studio. And we'll talk to you a little bit about what that is, what our teachers are involved in, and really, more importantly, the work that the students are doing this year. So tonight our agenda is to discuss with you Math Studio and the professional development that our teachers in grades four and five have received as well as provide a math experience for students and our Board of Ed members. So as I shared with you, last year we began our professional development with Math Studio. Math Studio was brought in to work with grades four and five. This year we've actually started working a little bit with two and three, and that's our, our future work for next year. So really, what was the purpose of Math Studio? Where did we come from, and how did it begin? Well. Teachers within the building, instructional leaders, administrators, we began by really reflecting on our own instructional practices. We really were forced to consider, are our students mathematically engaged? And what does that mean for a student to be mathematically engaged? And really, we were forced and pushed into thinking about how and if our current practice that we're using here in Berlin really aligns with the Common Core Standards and the Common Core Standards for math content and practice. So as a district, grades four and five, from Griswold, Hubbard, and Willard together, opened their doors, the teachers opened their doors and shared their students, their practices, and their ideas. Coaches supported the work we were doing with students and provided authentic training. What's great about this is a lot of times in the education field, you get professional development that is king. You hire someone to come in, they share with you their ideas and their practices, and that is now what Math Studio is. Math Studio came to us, they're working authentically with our teachers. They're looking at Berlin. They're looking at the curriculum we're implementing in our classrooms. And they're really helping our teachers based on wherever they are. And our educators are in different places based on experience and background. They're really helping them to develop and strengthen their own practice. And really, the focus has been helping teachers really shift their minds from that procedural to conceptual understanding and helping students really walk away with a conceptual understanding of mathematics. As a district, we explored what does an effective math classroom look like? 
what does it provide to students, and what opportunities are available to students each day. What is the research side? We're looking at current research, and very importantly, we're looking at how do children learn mathematics. And it's very different from the way even educators were trained to teach students how to teach mathematics. We're looking at current research and how that um, really tells us and pushes us into thinking about how do students learn mathematics best and what can we do today to really support them and their math skills. Ms. Watson. So as we're working with our teachers and students, we're using a tool um, that the company has designed that we're working with. And it gives us a lot of information when we go into classrooms, things to look for, things to focus on. And we've actually hand selected as, as we've gone through the practice, the different areas of focus based again, as Mr. Gray said, where we are in the process. So one of the most important indicators for student success is our teacher quality. And we have been doing a phenomenal job. Our teachers here are amazing, as you already know, I'm sure. And they are working really, really hard to develop their students' math understanding. We have actually heard from the middle school this year that the students came up could talk math better than they've ever seen. And that's because of the work that's being done in fourth and fifth grade. So we're excited to keep this moving and bring in our second and third grade teachers. Mm -hmm. So what we do when we work with teachers is we focus on the catalytic teaching routines and teaching habits. Some of the pieces to that include structuring, um, structuring worthwhile talk with our students. So if we're going to have discourse, it needs to be purposeful, okay? And we want to confer with students and ask questions so that we're understanding their thinking, not funneling their thinking and getting them to say exactly what we want, but what do they think. We're looking at ways to demonstrate public records of their thinking so they can look at representations, look at different pathways, and that they can talk they can find similarities, they can find differences, um, they can make connections between things and explore new ideas. So there are a number of things we're doing here and all of this work that the teachers do, hit the slide, is in an effort for students to develop their math habits of mind and interaction. So you've probably heard about the habits of mind we've done work with in the past. Well now it's mathematized and we're really getting kids to work through their stuck points to persevere to getting them to ask questions, to listen to each other, to understand each other's thinking, critique and debate, and really look at ways to reason and persevere. And in the end, our goal is for them to justify why something makes sense and how it can be generalized to other situations. So we're trying to build that vertical piece for them. So when they move forward into the next grade level, they still remember what they've learned and they can apply it to something new and different. So with that, we are going to do a quick activity <coughs> board members tonight and some of our fifth grade students from Willard School. Ms. Pasavento is here to help us out and we're very excited. She um, was very gracious to offer to help us at the last minute. Our math specialist had a family emergency and is very, very sorry she could not be here. Um, but she had to take care of her family tonight. And so Ms. Pasavento offered to step in and so we're going to give her a little break on that. All right, our fifth grade students who are here to join us, could you just come up to the table, please? You are in a moment. Aiden, Mateo, Matthew, Nora, Nina, Romeo, Emma, 
and Maya, and they've agreed to come here tonight, do a little nap with our Board of Ed members. So, Board of Ed members, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent, they're going to be joining you shortly. Um, but first, we're going to give everyone a little bit of time, right, Mrs. Watson, to look at the problem first. So um, one of the strategies that we use in our classroom is the free read strategy. Um, and what we do is we look at the different parts of the question and we ask ourselves what do we know and what do we still need to think through. So what I'm going to ask everybody who has the math problem in front of them, and you guys will have the math problem in front of you, is just think to yourself, what do we know in this problem and what do we still need to figure out? I'm going to give you what we call in our math habits, our purposeful private reasoning. So give you just a minute for you to work through that. Um, and then we'll talk about it all together. So it's the same problem that's on there. We're just showing it to you. Yeah, I, I apparently want to be part of that group. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because you don't want to do a math problem? Apparently. <laughs> oh, I think we should go on the board. Did they write down? Oh, yeah. Like a board member trip. Uh, yeah, I'm justified. Fisher. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jake's going down by himself. Will you come around though? Because I'm I can't get down there. Let's we'll see what you got, buddy. I'm telling you. Yo, come sit next time. Matt, good to meet you. So what do you got? That's the most fun I've ever had at the board. You said, you said, you said. Then I feel like I'm important. All right. Okay. This is what do you mean? Oh, this is so tweet-worthy. This is so tweet-worthy. Can I use your bowl? Yes. Oh, it's bonus day. <laughs> One, two, three. I have some teacher man. <laughs> so, here's how I normally structure my talk in my classroom. What I would do is I would say student A or student B, uh, and I would offer people to talk. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the adults, if you don't mind sharing your thinking first, because our students have very specific math language we use in the class, and we're going to add them to ask them to add on, read, agree or disagree, and use their math language to try to show you a lot of what they were thinking. So, if adults, you don't mind sharing your thinking first, and then students can add on, revoice, agree or disagree afterwards. Go for it. Fair enough. Uh, so I I I can agree with the fact that that is correct. That will have to turn into one. But if Matt can't do it, that makes it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. What if I'm going to do it? What if I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it. 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 I'm
because I noticed there are a lot of different strategies that going on. Ms. Watson was talking earlier about using different strategies in order to <coughs> be able to show what not thinking. There are so many different models and ways that we solve this. So I'm really interested in if you guys don't mind sharing out. Does anyone feel comfortable with sharing? Nina. Yeah. So what I did is first I converted the fraction to have a common denominator. Sure. So I converted one fourth into two eighths, and then I converted one half into four eighths. And so, since now they have the same denominator, I could find out which one is larger by the same by what their numerator is. But um, this isn't. We didn't take into account when while solving this problem the size of the candy bars. So. Tracy, I mean, it's okay. You're good. <laughs> Tracy, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Sissy, but you're fine. You're fine. There you go. Um, she was saying about how what if Julia's candy bar was much larger than Matt's candy bar, then one fourth would be much larger than one half of Matt's candy bar. But if they were both equal, or Matt's candy bar was larger then one half would be larger, the larger portion. That's great thinking. Does anyone want to add on, revoice, or ask a genuine question about that? Okay, what are you thinking? Um, I think that she's right. I think that Matt ate more of his candy bar than Julia did. Can you tell me why? What'd you do? Um, because I drew two um, rectangles right on top of each other. Okay. I split one into one, or uh, into a fourth. I just put one into halves, and then I colored them one half and one fourth, and I found out that one half is bigger than one, or is greater than one fourth. So I know that Matt had one fourth of his candy bar, and Julie had one. Um, Julie had one fourth, and Matt had one half, which means Matt had more of his candy bar. So when I went to work, I heard you and Mr. Benini having a great conversation. What's that one button? And it's just what Nina said. Um, of what if the candy bars aren't the same size? So right here, and I know audience, we did model our candy bars being the same size. But here we can see a model, and our students can't see this. If our candy bars are different size, so that's come up a lot. Can you give me a me too or a scene because if you're totally agreeing with that, and that's a conversation you have in your partnership? Well, the first thing we found out was that I don't like Snickers and I like Comfy Dash. Perfect. Which, you know, great example. They're different sizes. Yeah. And we both think rapidly, so we wound up kind of charting out the same line. Awesome. So we did some really awesome math thinking here, and we were thinking about fractions and different ways. Some students used it on denominators, some used models, some did it on ice number lines when I was walking around. So it was really interesting to see those multiple pathways that they're using. But we came down to one thing, and I think every group said it. It all depends on what? Science. The size. Science. So in our math thinking, that's a conjecture that we would have used. And that comes before our generalizations, but that's just a conjecture that we're thinking about. So does anyone want to talk you through that? Romeo, what do you think, Ed? I was talking with my partner, and I, um... I was saying that she said that what if the sizes were like, what if Julia had a king size and what if yeah. Matt had a smaller size? And in a way, Julia would be right because, well, Matt or Julia, I don't know. What that, yeah, Julia said that it's not always true that one fourth is bigger than, that one half is always bigger than one fourth because what if it was one and, and one fourth, that it would be a whole bigger? So students and audience and board members and everyone here, a conjecture that we created today when we were all together is that when comparing fractions, we need to take into consideration the size of the whole. So we agreed and we talked about who might be right. And in both cases, they could be right. And in some cases, we might say inconclusive and we have no idea. But when we're looking at fractions and we're comparing fractions, we always need to take into consideration the size of the whole. And that's a question. As a conjecture, we might say, is this always true? Is this sometimes true? Or is this never true? Um, I actually um, converted mine into fractions. Awesome. 
I turned the 1 fourth into 4 sixteenths, and I turned the 1 half into 8 sixteenths. Awesome. So in this, they would be the same size. I don't know if that's entirely true, though, that they are the same size. Okay. So. so it totally depends on the size of the hole, right? <coughs> because you could have drawn a model, and that could absolutely be true. So, so why don't we have, oh, let's look at the clap. A visual of what takes place in our math classes each day in grades four and five. And as Mrs. Watson said, we we started in grades two and three this year, and next year we're excited to move our work into that as well. Because again, it's about really building that conceptual understanding and getting away from the procedural. And as you can see, students and board members uh, did a lot of great things. So thank you for uh, yeah. Can I collecting those for me? Yeah. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. To be clear though, since my name is Matt, I would have eaten all of the candy bar and I would have eaten more. So um, I would like to make a formal request that we do that every board meeting because that was that was a lot of fun and it was actually I, I really liked the way that went, you know. I mean the whole idea of you know, here's the question, but you don't have everything you need to answer the question is something that's a lifelong uh, lesson that I think a lot of us <laughs> see all the time where people jump to conclusion and they don't really know all the facts. So uh, anyway, that was that was a cool way to do it. That was a lot of fun for us. Alex can attest the first answer I wrote down was Greenland, so I definitely <laughs> on a bad tangent. <laughs> Thank you. We, we really enjoyed that, in case you can't tell. Um, next up, we have some special recognition. We have art awards. Um, we recently held our annual art show at the New Britain Museum of American Art, and there were um, many pieces of artwork there on display. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Benigni. Thank you very much, Mr. Tenza. If I could, I'd like to have each... I got them here. If I could, I'd like to have each student come up one at a time. Um, I'll read your name. I'd like you to show your artwork to the audience and just make a brief comment about your artwork. Um, if I could, um, the first student, which was actually the superintendent's choice, the title was A Very Good Time by Ashani Patel. Is Ashani here? I'm not going to ask every administrator to comment, but if this was my choice, and when I walked into the art museum that day, I just thought of being picking raspberries with my family, and uh, just a love for raspberries. It just stuck out right away to me. So thank you very much, Ashani. Next, if I could have, this is the Griswold Principal's Choice, um, David Kitzman. It's uh, Rainbow Blossoms by Gretchen Peralt. Gretchen, come out over here, honey. Go right up to the microphone and show me. Let me hold you. 
the floor. You want to talk? <coughs> so this might look very complicated, but it actually wasn't. Um, <laughs> Modesty, I love it. <laughs> what we did is we took a white crayon and we had this paper that we drew on Sharpie with to make the design and we put that under watercolor paper and drew over it with the white crayon and then all we had to do is simply use watercolor and yeah and the reason I called it rainbow blossom was because to me it just looks like rainbows that are blossoming. I love it. Thank well you very much, very Gretchen. Nice. Thank you. Mr. Kitchen? All right, I never wanted to pass up an opportunity to speak on a microphone. So, um, Gretchen, I wanted you to know the reason I selected your artwork too is because we put our artwork in a very special place for the whole year in the hallway. And when I walked in, I saw this and it immediately brightened my mood. And that's what I'm hoping it'll do next year in our main hallway. Nice job, Gretchen. We're very proud of you. Next, we have the Hubbard's Principal's Choice called Entitled Self-Portrait by Addison Howes. Addison? So this is my painting of me. I used my favorite color, green, and it was my true color, and so I did three different shades of green light green, regular green, and dark green. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Mr. Sousa? Sure. And the reason why I selected the, uh, the portrait was just, might be a little deep, but when I first <laughs> viewed it, I just thought it was pretty neat that this is a self-portrait of her, but all the different colors, I kind of thought of the different facets of like your personality. If you look at just like the ears are two different shades, the mouth is, is different shades, her face is different shades. So she is who she is, but all the different facets and pieces that make up who she is. I thought that was a really, a, a really strong, powerful message that I got from this. That's why I chose it, it was excellent. Next, we have the Willard's Principal's Choice, entitled Blue and Red Flower, by Chloe Cuckle. Do you want Mr. Cray to hold this so you can talk in the mic? Do you want me to hold it? Want both to hold it because it's a big one? Okay. All right, the microphone's all yours, <laughs> Chloe. So I named this the blue and red flower because those were one of my two favorite colors and I thought they would look really nice together and what I did is I did blues in the light shades and through the middle shades and the dark shades and I thought it would look really nice so that's why I did it. Blue being one of my favorite colors. I, uh, I was immediately drawn to this, and in a season where you've had way too much rain, I know it's needed at times, your picture, Chloe, put a big smile on my face and reminded me that spring was here, and the sun was coming out, and this is just something I could look at all day long. Very proud of you, nice job. We have the McGee uh, Principal's Choice, uh, entitled The Guardian. I'm sorry, there's a note by, entitled, uh, it's untitled, by Alex Polosik. Is Alex here? So, this is my piece. It's, um, it's based off of a hummingbird. And um, while I was looking at pictures to do for oil pastel, um, I was looking for a few pictures to do. And as I was looking, I found a hummingbird picture. It looked pretty like uh, complicated. And I thought, this is a challenge that I can do. So I used stippling as a technique for the multicolors on the bird. And yeah, 
I just had a lot of fun made, making it. So when I uh, came into the uh, New Britain Museum of Art, again, I, I was a science teacher, so I love wildlife. And I noticed all the colors. I love the colors. I like how um, Alex went from light to dark. You could tell it's very purposeful. Can you explain how you did the background? Well, honestly, it wasn't too complicated. I just took... It was complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, the background wasn't that hard. I just uh, I took a paper towel. Um, I wrapped it around my finger. And I used my nail to scratch off the background to give it a little blur effect. Mm -hmm. Did you invent that yourself, Alex? No, I learned it from one of my art teachers. And he learned it from his art teacher, so very nice job. Berlin High School's Principal's Choice in the 2D category entitled The New Guardian by Connor Gagnon. This is my artwork. Um, it's titled The New Guardian. I made it in Adobe Photoshop, and um, I just used a couple of simple blending methods and tools to create it. Uh, I'd like to thank um, my art teacher, Mrs. Galasso, for uh, helping me make it. And um, yeah, voila. <laughs> I really loved uh, Connor's art piece. It was when I walked into uh, the New Britain Art Gallery, it, it just, it caught my eye and I found myself just continually staring at it. There's actually, if you have a chance to look at it up close, there's a, a lot of depth to that, um, to what he did and the, just the idea that he combined a lot of images and he brought some really interesting color and everything and I'm really excited for that to be showcased in our main lobby at the high school. And also uh, Berlin High School's 3D Choice, entitled Free and Sophisticated by Juliana Garcia. This is my artwork, it's called Free um, and Sophisticated. Um, I did this in my 3D sculpture class, and um, its whole theme is just supposed to be um, your free, your free spirit, and um, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Um, expand your wings and just travel. That's all I was having in mind when I was making it. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> So what I loved about this is the fact that Juliana took some, something that for many of us would seem very ordinary in terms of books and pages and look at what it is that she created and she also used a variety of um, different mediums in terms of the wire sculpting and, and yarn and paint and a bunch of other things in order to create this design and both of these are just wonderful representations of what our students can do at a very sophisticated level when they have the opportunity to study um, art as they do at our high school. So we're really, really excited about the work that they do at the high school. Congratulations. We congratulate all of the award winners. It's phenomenal work and we're very proud of the work that you've done. If I could just also thank um, all of the art teachers in the district, the work that they do with the students, their creativity day in and day out, um, it really shows. And to have an art show that encompasses K-12 is a wonderful event at our art museum. And a special thank you to uh, Kathy Miller in the back, um, previously our K-12 uh, art coordinator who started that first event. So with uh, Mary Smealy, who's, who's since retired. But um, we hope to keep that going. So thank you all, and congratulations. Thank you.
Next up on our agenda, we have our committee reports. <clears throat> We'd like to start with our student representatives and their report from the high school. So there's been a couple senior milestones that are you know, coming and going. We had our capstone exhibition last Thursday that went incredible. Uh, senior prom's coming up this Saturday, and we have our awards night tomorrow, actually. And spring sports last season's winding down. Um, just absolute dominance by the Redcoats this season, and we won seven <laughs> division titles. So we've done a great job. It's been a great year. Okay. Also coming up in the next week, the freshmen are visiting the high school on the 4th for the fly-up day. And on the following day, June 5th, the uh, high school is hosting the scholarship night. And that Friday, the 7th, the band's hosting their Jazz with Pizzazz. Great. Thank you. Um, I will take a break right after we do the committee reports, so if anybody needs to take a break at that point. But um, next up, we have the Student Achievement Committee. I guess they had a meeting earlier today. We did. Um, we discussed a new geometry textbook that we will be talking more about later on in the meeting for motion and adoption. Um, it ties in nicely with Common Core uh, and some of the other techniques that we're using with geometry and it's replacing a book that was originally brought into the district or last published in 1992. So it's a nice, nice time for change. Not a lot's changed in the geometry world, thankfully, but it's nice to have a new book coming out for the kids. Great, thank you, Tim. And lastly, under this agenda item is correspondence to the board. No correspondence to the board, excuse me. Uh, that would be true for the superintendent, but I will say that for me that would not be true. I've received multiple emails from parents and concerned citizens um, about the budget process, about some of the items that we had on the list of things that may be reduced. Um, and I want to just go out and thank everybody who took the time to send the, me or the board something uh, for us to look at as we went through what proofs. It's actually still going on, right? So we're still waiting the results of today's referendum. Um, but it's been a long and tedious, at times frustrating, but and challenging budget process. So we want to thank you, all the parents, all this, the citizens, for their support um, as we've gone through this. Um, with that, we'll take a brief recess, five minutes. Uh, there's cookies somewhere in the room, over here next to Mr. Urso, which means there may not be as many as we started. <laughs> but please help yourself on the way out, and then we'll we'll readjourn. <clears throat> readjourn. Readjourn. All right, we will uh, re reconvene our meeting. Uh, next up is uh, the audience of citizens. Is there anybody who would like to address the Board of Education this evening? No hands waving, no jumping up and down, and closed. Okay, consent agenda. <clears throat> is there anybody who would like to add, remove, or discuss anything from consent agenda? There's only two items in there. All right, then I'll entertain a motion about consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Motion by Tim. Second. Second by Jamie. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. All right. Off to new business. First up, upbeat potential service trip to the Dominican Republic. Jack, you're on. All right. So, uh, I'm just here to kind of do an initial presentation about some research I looked into for international service trips. Um, I spoke with uh, Dr. Basso uh, that has done a number of, and I'm sorry, I'm standing right in front of the board, I guess, uh, has done a number of international trips uh, through his content and through his work with um, the state, and he put me into contact with uh, an educational um, 
educational trip organization called EF uh, Tour. So um, over the last month or so, I've kind of communicated back with them about a potential service uh, trip opportunity for uh, the students at Berlin High. And so I want to go through some a little information about the trip uh, for you guys. So the first few slides are just um, student, student quotes or teacher uh, quotes about their experience. And um, I'm not going to necessarily read all of them for you guys, but I can send them to you guys. And I've spoken with some uh, educators in the state of Connecticut that have gone uh, through this company on different service trips as well. Uh, so the first one I like is international travel, travel helped uh, open my eyes and become more in tune with the world around me. Another, a teacher says, uh, students stepped out of their comfort zones, friendships were strengthened as they experienced uh, this event together. Uh, there aren't enough objectives to describe this experience. It was utterly amazing and incredible food, sights, and experience everyone must go. So today what we're going to quickly go over is why an international service trip uh, why do I? Why did I think that this was something that the district needed? Um, what our partnership with this EF tours, what their kind of background is, um, where and when we were going, when, where and when uh, we would be going, uh, an outlined uh, tour itinerary, just kind of a uh, what a day would look like, um, what's included and what's not included in the cost of the trip, um, and then price and. Uh, this is also a parent PowerPoint, so I'm not going to tell you guys how to enroll. Uh, but if you guys give me a thumbs up to kind of move forward with this, that would be great. So, uh, if anyone doesn't know, I'm Mr. Rudy. I am in charge of the Upbeat program. I've been at Berlin High for three years. Um, and one thing that I experienced while part of the Berlin school systems was my freshman year of high school. Uh, the wrestling team would go on an uh, international trip every four years. Uh, they had gone to uh, China, they had gone to Italy, and I was lucky enough to go on the last trip, uh, which was to Brazil. Uh, so uh, Coach Day uh, planned these trips every four years, and members of the wrestling team would be able to compete under Team Connecticut and travel on these trips. Um, it wasn't just an athletic uh, competition trip, we also did a level of service. So on our trip to Brazil, uh, we competed with uh, the Brazil national wrestling team when we were in Sao Paulo. We competed in a tournament when we were in Rio. Um, but the most rewarding part for me was our trip to a small village called Porto Alegre. Um, there we worked with uh, a minister from the states that was trying to bring wrestling into this small community. So. We went into some of the schools and we did wrestling clinics. Um, and it was as a freshman and as someone that ever since middle school wanted to be an educator, wanted to be a teacher, uh, it was definitely an experience that that I, you know, cherish and remember for for the you know last 15 years. Um, part of this trip and those first few quotes from students is exactly the same feeling I got from it. Um, it was the experiences, it was the friendships, it was different outlook outside of our Berlin um, community that really kind of made me want to step out post high school, uh, going a little bit farther outside of Connecticut um, when I decided to attend college. Sadly, I didn't have an uh, opportunity to travel when I was in college, but um, I think giving our students more of an opportunity now uh, will help them because a lot of college tracks uh, now they're being more strict of like you have to complete certain things at certain times and um, international travel is definitely more encouraged in college uh, but sometimes it's harder for students so I think um, giving them an opportunity in high school would be a great experience and then obviously with my background of upbeat service was uh, the kind of trip I looked into uh, this organization though had many variety of trips um, they had uh, kind of like grade um, not grade level but content trips, they had science specific trips, they had social studies specific, they had leadership um, summits in uh, Europe, they had service trips, so there's a wide uh, range to kind of select from and I went down the service trip track. Uh, so EF Educational Tours, uh, they are a world leader in international education. Um, they have over 50 plus years of experience. They've traveled to over uh, 53 countries with 500 
uh, plus schools. I've talked to uh, two teachers from Connecticut that have traveled with them, not including Dr. Basso that has traveled with them before as well. Um, they are accredited. So through EF Travels, you can get certain academic credits. Uh, and I'll kind of explain that uh, more. And they work to guarantee as low of a price by trying to group different schools together. Uh, so if a school gets has 40 travelers, then their price is that. But if a school has 10, then they try to group you with another school to keep all costs low. Once you sign on to it, your cost stays at what the uh, initial agreed, agreed upon price was. It's not like as it gets closer, it fluctuates. So that's nice. Here is just a quick video. Not connect to speaker, so. Uh, 
um, coverage. So it's a very extensive coverage for every, if, if someone were to get hurt on Monday and then on Tuesday, each incident has that same uh, amount of coverage. So that's always a nice um, kind of aspect to feel comfortable that um, you know, if something were to happen, we have, we have that kind of coverage. Um, so the group travel aspect is kind of what I mentioned earlier, where if we don't have um, a certain number of students, they look to group us with other uh, schools, uh, potentially not necessarily other schools in Connecticut, but could be other schools around the country. So um, that aspect keeps it affordable, keeps it um, at a reasonable cost, allows students to still travel, um, and you know gives that flexibility to match us with other groups. So some aspects of uh, the trip that you get out of it educational-wise is uh, you can collect three college credits uh, from uh, traveling on this trip, and there is some extra coursework and a small extra cost that goes along with it. I think it's in over $200 or $250, and a little bit of extra coursework, so then you can get three college credits. And the college credits um, are from University of Southern New Hampshire. Um, so. Um, a fairly well, you know, a, a well enough known institution that um, hopefully those those credits could transfer uh, to other institutions that you might be applying to. Um, it's also a great uh, experience to put on a college uh, application. You know, when you talk about what you've done, you know, a lot of college applications they don't care that you've played a sport or you've done this. They want to know what other experiences you've had and that you'll bring to their institution. So definitely an experience like that could could really uh, have a uh, a college application uh, or an essay. So some of the service learning is, uh, the big thing is this cultural immersion. Uh, we work with the schools, we work with the community leaders, um, and another level to it is uh, leadership development. So you, after your service in the afternoon, uh, you meet with community leaders and you talk about kind of what's happening in their community. Uh, some days you'll, you'll come up with an action plan or things that you guys um, that the students could do going home to s continue to support it. So it's not just a eight days, we're done, we're out, and then you know we forget about it. It's how can we continue this service? How can we continue this effort um, going going back back to Berlin? So out of the students that we would like to attend on this trip, we are really looking for a service learner, someone that's willing to kind of unplug, step away from. Uh, you know, our devices, our technology. Uh, we will be in um, good accommodations, but in areas like that, you won't always have service. You won't always have, um, you know, access to your, your phones. And it's really an encouraging of to step away and be in the moment. Um, can, you, can you handle bugs? Um, open to try new foods? Uh, you know, respecting the local people and the culture? Uh, and willing to kind of give your 100 percent, 110 percent into this experience. Uh, everyone says with anything you do, for whatever you put into it is what you'll get out of it. So, you know, it's really encouraged that if you're going to be attending a trip like this, that you're ready to give, give your all to it. A little bit about of our, uh, our experience is we will be, I can't pronounce it, uh, but I think it's Santiago. Uh, that's what we'll be flying into. Uh, from there, we travel to the northern coast region, and part of our sightseeing is we will be visiting the mangrove forest, um, which is uh, within a bus ride travel from that. From Santiago to the northern uh, coast region, it is a bus trip. Uh, it's not, you don't have to, we don't have to take another flight, uh, so it is bus transportation there. And then um, you'll also be getting your service project by working with So some highlights of the trip is you'll be participating in a local service project at one of the schools. You'll explore the mangrove forest by a boat. Um, you'll take a guided hike on the beautiful north, uh, north coast and practice your Spanish uh, with the locals. Uh, obviously, immersing into that local culture, you're going to work on um, your, your speaking skills. I don't know Spanish. Um, that's why I talked to uh, some staff members that do know more Spanish than me, um, and they are interested in going as well. 
Um, so just a, kind of a, a basic day on the tour. Um, in the morning, you'll have breakfast. Uh, you'll head to the local uh, community center or school uh, where you'll help the, the teachers uh, teach uh, English tutoring lessons or sessions uh, to students there. In the afternoon, uh, you'll have lunch, and then you'll visit, uh, this is one of the sightseeing trips, so you'll visit the mangrove forest and take a boat ride and uh, swim. Not every afternoon you'll do that same trip. They'll, they have other sightseeing or community um, integration. And then in the evening, uh, participate in a conversation about uh, how someone's circumstances influence his or her opportunities in life. So a big part of this trip is really reflecting. Uh, students are given a journal at the beginning and are asked to journal their way through the trip and reflecting on kind of uh, what they have compared to what these uh, students in this community uh, might not have. So it's definitely a very reflective, reflective trip. So some, some of the travelers have said that 95% uh, uh, have expanded their knowledge of the world around them, 92% discovered more about themselves, 98% grew more confident and independent, and 89% understand uh, more about new people, places, and cultures. So that's a kind of a little bit of a background of the trip, and obviously the big thing that a lot of people want to know is what's the cost? Um, so, the overall, oh, <laughs> back quick. doesn't want us to know that. So the overall cost of the trip is uh, $3,230. Um, so it sounds expensive. But there are a, a, a large number of things that you get with the, included in the trip. Um, and that's just the oh. Okay. So uh, what's included is round trip airfare, uh, safe, uh, quality hotel rooms. So uh, students will stay in hotel rooms with private bathrooms. It's not. Uh, this isn't a trip where you are staying with local community members or in families. You are, you know, staying in um, a, a hotel resort is um, setting for safety that safe, safety aspects and um, privacy aspects. You have a 24/7 bilingual tour director on tour transportation. Uh, you get an educational itinerary, guided tours and activities, breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, each day. Uh, travel support team, uh, what this organization sets up for you is a tour donation page, so somewhat like a GoFundMe, so you have a, your tour donation page so you can send out that link uh, to family and friends to help them uh, support the cost of your trip, uh, so that's a nice aspect. Um, we, are, we share an uh, online educational platform, uh, Uncommon App College Essay Toolkit, surf, uh, Certified Service Hours, so for uh, districts that have um, graduation requirements for a number of service hours, you would get this on this trip. Uh, Berlin does not have uh, a, a service hour requirement. Uh, leadership building activities, uh, you'll get a backpack. And then the global travel protection plan, uh, that is included in the cost of the trip. And that safeguards people as they get closer to the trip. If they cannot uh, attend, they're able to get um, a refund back on the trip for whatever. Uh, reason. So there's um, kind of that travel insurance for that. Uh, things that it doesn't cover is the passport and the visa, uh, the airport baggage fees, spending money, additional snacks, uh, tips, and college credit. So that's an additional cost. Like you said, that's between $200 and $250 um, with additional coursework. So if you were to go on this trip and uh, do the college credit, it would end up being around $3,500 uh, for the trip and the college credit. For anyone that has sent their kids to college, that was you know, about the cost of three credits at the University of Maryland. Uh, so that's how I compared it. Uh, so in order for someone to uh, sign up, they would need to put down a $95 deposit. Then there are payment plans. Uh, if it was bi-weekly, it'd be $131 uh, bi-weekly from June 20th this year to June 20th um, 
when we leave. If you were to pay monthly, it would be 226 in full, 230, uh, sorry, 300, uh, $3,230. And the kind of added aspect to it is you have that um, donation page in which you can collect funds, um, which will end up uh, making that last payment the least. Um, it wouldn't kind of span out across the payments, it would just make that last payment. And so I know I went through that very quickly. Um, I didn't want to kind of take up. Does anyone have any questions for me about the trip, about the organization, anything like that? How, how will you, what, what grades will you consider for this? So um, I would consider all four grades. Uh, this, or, um, this organization does trips uh, from middle school up to high school. I talked with a teacher that does middle school trips out of Ridgefield, and then a high school teacher that does trips out of Canton. Um, so I would be, I would open this up to um, freshmen through um, junior year, because it's a uh, year away. So, and this falls outside of the traditional school year. Correct. So my question is, and perhaps Brian, you can, you may be the one to answer this: is Does it require board approval since it is outside of the school year? Uh, Jack and I had that conversation, and Jack is was in contact with someone. That does it outside of the school? Uh, but the thought is, if it's going to be sponsored by the school, even though it's happening after the school year, and there's going to be fundraising, and Jack, as the um, UPE coordinator, is going to run it, you know, there's whether it's an upbeat trip, which is tied to the school, or it's a Berlin High School trip, even though it's outside, there's still a lot of implications for it because Jack's running it. Is there a minimum maximum? Like a minimum of how many people, maximum of how many? So the maximum uh, is 40, <coughs> say no more than 40. Um, the minimum, they, they don't have uh, a minimum. Generally, it would be six, uh, six people. Uh, is probably their, if, it, if you had below six, then you probably wouldn't um, do it. Uh, they're hoping for around 20, so then grouping with another, another school would get you at to that 35, um, which they generally travel or group with at 35. Um, so they're hoping to get between 50 and 20. Would staff pay for themselves? What? Staff would they pay for themselves? No, so for every six students that attend, the adult is in so they're three thousand two hundred and thirty dollars with a portion of if you get six, six staff. Yes. One six. So if you get twelve students, then two staff are able to go. If you get, you know, so if you get ten students, only one staff is able. To How many? Um, <laughs> uh, staff could could pay if we, you know, if we were to get ten. More than, then um, more staff than. Yeah, if you have one or two, they could pay. And the, the added bonus for the staff is you can also get graduate level credit as an adult attending this trip. Um, so you can pay for a graduate level and do that extra coursework to get three grad level classes. Uh, Just a right. question, um, yeah. just out of curiosity, I mean, they do travel all around the world. Why, um, why choose uh, the Dominican Republic? So um, we were looking into two trips at, in that time frame. So they were traveling to the Dominican Republic and then Ecuador. Um, and uh, Ecuador was definitely a very appealing trip. Uh, you, it was more of a science service thing, so uh, more environmental science, uh, so planting trees. Um, so you would travel out to actually the Galapagos Islands, which was sounding very, very enticing. For the first trip, it was more expensive than this one. Um, it was a little bit longer. So out of the two time, uh, two trip options they had, in that time frame, um, I felt comfortable with this. Also, you know, I, I think a lot of, uh, in my experience working with the beat students and even a lot of the high school, they enjoy working with the elementary kids, working with the other kids. So I think that this would have been an experience. And also to see students in a different country um, definitely is, a, is an eye-opening kind of experience to see, all right, what was it like in elementary school for me? Now, what is it like for them? So that's kind of, it was it was those two options, and I went more to this one because it was it was cheaper for the for the first trip. Do they only do Latin America? Or do they do other places? They do all over the world. Um, they have trips that go to China, to Europe, Asia, um, all over the all over the world. 
any idea what kind of interest you have? Uh, so I've talked to a, a few students and they seem very interested. Uh, yeah, but waited. they didn't tell mom and dad it was thirty two hundred dollars yet, though. <laughs> right. So, so the idea is to the idea is to then at that parent meeting is having that because um, you know when you sit on that number, but without having the other information, then it, that starts to kind of weigh on the options. Um, so the idea is that if we were to go forward, then we would have a parent meeting and present all of the information, what they're going to get, what the experience is going to look like, what the cost, and how it breaks down um, for for parents. So I'm sure you've given this some thought. Um, what does going forward look like? From here? Mm -hmm. So what going forward uh, at this point looks like is uh, trying to set up a, setting up a parent meeting uh, prior to the end of the school year. Um, so working with this company, they've, um, they're willing, they're coming, they would come out to that parent meeting, uh, give some information from them. They would also speak, also uh, two of the teachers that have gone on these trips from other um, towns in, in Connecticut are willing to speak at those as well. So going forward was is putting out this information to parents, to students, um, and seeing what that interest is at that meeting. Um, if the interest isn't there, then we might table this for for a future future year. Um, talking with the company, I said, you know, what if what if we can't get something together for next year? She's like, no problem. We can push it back to 2021. Um, so they're very, they're very flexible and, and willing to kind of work, work with us. Um, what they normally say is, is keep it in a, in a year uh, because when you have it over two or three years, then you know, in order to sign up necessarily in time, if you're a sophomore or freshman, parents are like, ah, three years away, I'm not really thinking about that. Um, so they, they do recommend do it within kind of a mm -hmm. year span. Um, do we have any? Any idea of what the board liability would be or, or risks? In, in, I mean, obviously there's a million risks, right? So, um, the, Even with the insurance policy that Jack spoke of, there still is board liability, obviously, if it's a school-sponsored trip, just as there's any field trip. And that's the rationale and why I wanted it to, Jack to bring it here. Um, obviously, taking a global field trip outside of the country um, if you look at some of the other districts, and we spoke of this before, there are many districts that have these type of trips or service trips um, attached to their um, education. Um, so it's a unique opportunity, but the liability is definitely there, even with the riders that Jack's, Jack talked about. But I can get, I can get more descriptive from Kerma, our insurance company, about. Yeah, we'd have to consider that before we can. You know, really <coughs> We've actually, in Southington, we've used DF tours a lot. It's worked out very well. It's really well organized. Um, there's never been a trip that has any issues. The only issue we had was when the Icelandic volcanoes erupted and they kept the kids from getting out of Europe because they closed all the airports for a couple of days or so a few days late getting back. But the, the food, the organization, the structure, everything has gone very, very well. The only thing was that you mentioned the college credit issue. Yes. There's also a high school credit piece of this that's in their little brochure. Yeah. That has caused a little bit of, an, of a problem because kids are sold the bill saying, hey, you can get high school credit for this, but they don't bother to get the approval ahead of time. And some girl did a PowerPoint for me and wanted high school credit, which is basically a PowerPoint of her trip. So yeah. the idea of getting it all approved in advance was with the, the uh, administration of the school was a big deal. And that's why I left that part out of it. Yeah. Um, I, to me, I, I thought, and I didn't ask this question further to them, I thought that high school credit would be that, because a lot of schools have that um, 0.5 service credit, that service hours, so I thought that's what it applied to, but Vermont, Vermont doesn't have that requirement. But if it's, um, if they have that option, you know, obviously, if, you know, with, with you guys and Ms. Eustis, um, agreeing to potentially get high school credit. Well, the company, yeah. if the company comes and speaks to the parents, they might sell that point. Right, so that's where I would tell them to the administration. Right, right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rich, it's, it's helpful to hear that from someone who's, a, who's you know, encountered this company as, and as, as students that have gone through that. So, uh, that's a little bit of comfort for me, it's even multiple though. Multiple trips every year we've had going through it. No issues. Even though I was lucky enough to have us, just like you, as the a child who traveled abroad for six months. Um, and all of those things that you listed are all values they came back with. But, um, you know, we have to look at how it impacts the district overall. Eileen. Um, just a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. The last two high schools that I lived in also had um, a 
wide variety of um, out of the country travel, some of it service, some of it um, purely like language immersion that even expanded into two and three week long programs in the summer where they were partnering up or doing and also doing exchanges. Um, and sometimes they will partner with um, another district um, in order to make it a little bit more cost effective. The other thing too is that it is, um, you know, it, it would be a really nice opportunity to offer to our students. As a family, it could be potentially very, even more expensive to take your whole family somewhere. So in some ways, we may be able to offer an opportunity or service that perhaps a family may not be able to do for their child. I also think too, going into college, um, and even, or any other sort of post-secondary um, work or opportunity that um, this could really be a potential uh, growth opportunity. I have to be honest with you, I put a lot of feelers out this year, trying to encourage people to start to look into this, to see if anybody was interested in really Jack's, um, Jack's really the person that came forward to be like, yeah, I've been thinking about this and I'd really like to pursue this. And um, so I was really happy to see that um, he was willing to come forward and you know, we are on a little bit of a sliding um, timeline. Like we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily have enough interest for you know a year from this June. You know, we can certainly put it off because it does take time. You, you typically have to be at least 12, if not 18 months out ahead of time. Um, but I do think that this would open the doorway to perhaps uh, to perhaps provide other opportunities. Um, music groups that go and travel abroad, um, students that are in world language will take opportunities. Sometimes science programs will take uh, take opportunities travel abroad and experience a wide variety of things. And while you do want to be careful because you don't want to necessarily be running these kind of trips all the time, you can at least start to get yourself on a cycle and kids can plan ahead of time and have things to look forward to when they, when they come into high school. Thank you. I, I just I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I applaud both of you to really push for this. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I think it's you know, something that's very commonplace that other districts do. Um, I personally would have zero hesitation about moving forward. Um, I you know, understand that we want to take these things seriously, but I, I hope as a board we could move very, very quickly um, to, 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 to give this opportunity to move forward because I think time is of the essence. And if we really want to have the opportunity in 2020 um, to get that message out very, very quickly would be useful. Um, so our next board meeting is June 10th, <clears throat> but what I would say is that Eileen and Jack is, is I, I, without a major objection, I would, uh, I would encourage you to start with the parent meeting because really the first step is to find out what interest there is. Without the interest, there's no program. Um, I think that probably you would get approval um, we would have to, you know, we find out some more details and particularly, you know, talk with our insurance folks to find out what kind of liability the board has there. But uh, I'm a, I mean, personally, I'm an advocate of international travel. I think it, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for kids to see other parts of the world and, and experience other cultures and, and, you know, meet different people and so forth. So I, I think that what you would need to do, though, is get a meeting of, you know, an organizational meeting on the on the calendar mm -hmm. to find out if there's any interest. Yeah, and we would need to be looking, say, the initial deposit is $95, and <coughs> like we would need to be looking at that until early fall. So it's not just to generate interest, and then if people really wanted to commit, when we come back early on in the school year, that's when we would really look for people to full on commit to that. So the way it kind of outlines is at that parent meeting, then from there, there's a link in which you can, if you know, after that parent meeting, if people are on board and they want it, you know, they can make that deposit at that time. People can sign on at any point along the process. Jenna's already filling out her application. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, people, people could uh, sign on at any point along the process. It just gives you a small, a shorter portion of time to so those. So let me ask. So you said you would look at all four grades, mm -hmm. but the reality is you would leave after high school graduation, which means you're really only looking at three grades because those kids will have graduated out of the system or at that point. Grade. So would you open it to the junior through eighth grade as a step up eighth graders for that information? Because they'd, be, they'd be coming in. Because they would be freshmen. Yeah. Yeah. Is, 
So yeah, that would be that would be my thought. That's process. that's that was the question. Okay. And Jenny, you can't go. Talk about that because um, only because sometimes I mean I'm certainly open to it, but that would definitely be a conversation with parents. Like the they would have young. to be really willing to send a child that perhaps oh. at that point in time is 14 or 15. Mm. Oh, and exactly. We want to make sure that that you know that child is definitely like ready and willing. <coughs> That's actually so, where I was yes, headed. Was we, we actually so. discussed that whole notion of that graduation would actually fall before the, the, the trip would leave. Yeah. So really, you're looking at probably three grades realistically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? No? Thank you. So, Jim. No, I was just going to point out the the 262 roughly month or biweekly cost really only works up to 12 payments. So even if parents didn't start paying until September. They would be done paying by March, conceivably. No, it was it was 131 biweekly. Biweekly. Two sixty-two monthly. Two sixty-two monthly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's roughly eight dollars and seventy-nine cents a day. Roughly. <laughs> <laughs> it's an info <laughs> market. So McDonald's. McDonald's value meal. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> okay. Where are we next? Summer instructional program. Cindy and I can't believe that the end of the school year is already here and we're talking about summer school. But this is just a brief um, summary of what our summer school program looks like. So as you've heard in the past, we have a five-week program and we have a four-week program. Um, the five-week program runs from June 24th to the 26th. It's four hours a day, five days a week. And this is really for our most significant learners. You've heard us talk about the BLAST program. Um, so it's really our students in the BLAST program from preschool up to middle school. background so how do we determine this so right now we have about 460 students identified um, as special education students <coughs> 400 of 403 of them are actually in district so the, the the other students are either in out of district placements private Moreland St. Paul's or magnet schools so out of our 403 <coughs> students Right now, as it sits today, we have about 125 students recommending and attending summer school. So it's really our most significant students. And on the front page is the criteria that we ask our staff when we're in our meetings with our families, who are those students that are eligible for summer school services? So we look at the nature and severity of the student's disability. Um, we really look over April vacation, Christmas vacation, who are those students when they come back after being off a week <coughs> lose skills and it takes them a long time to get caught up um, because that's significant being off for two months of school. So who are those students that really need to be part of our summer programming so when they come back they're in a good place. Um, then we have some students with just more significant needs. Then they may have aggressive or self-injurious behaviors. Um, they may have some stereotypical <coughs> behaviors that it's just important to be in the same routine and structure um, for, for that month of July. Um, so on the back, we just, again, in these numbers, we have PPTs <coughs> right now going up to the last day of school. But um, it says three preschoolers in our four-week program. I did reach out to Michelle. She said we're up to six right now, and it could go up even more. Um, 
so this gives you a breakdown of who our students are, what program they will be attending. Um, the choice students, that is a double number, so that 18 is already included in our K-5 to numbers. But we do have a significant number of students who participate in our choice program who will be attending our summer school program, which is helpful for these kids. Um, and there's the breakdown of the staff that we need. If the choice students attend summer program, are those funds reimbursed by Hartford? Yes. Okay. Yep. Everything but transportation, because they don't bill us for transportation, but yes. When we give them our, our, our bill in October, it includes summer program. Okay. Um, Thank you. You know, I know. I only ask because you know the questions that we get yep. all the time. Yep. So. Yep. Um, what's been asked in the past, you know, I know Rich and Carrie brought it up last year, the, the four hour, the four week program, three hours a day, you know, three days a week doesn't seem like a lot. I asked Cindy to really look at the students' IEPs. Um, at the elementary level, if we go above that, we're actually giving them more that's in their IEP. So the elementary level, we are doing what's required by the student's individual education plan. At the secondary level, we are a little below, but again, that's because the secondary, we look at special ed hours according to the classes. So if they're in an English class at the high school, how long do those run? Three hours and 40 minutes a week. Three hours and 40 minutes a week. So just by default of their classes, their English class, their math class, and their writing class, it's a period, it's a full period, so that's what they're getting for special education services. Um, I did, Rich asked me to reach out to um, Southington to see if, are there creative ways to do summer school? Um, would it be helpful for Southington and Berlin to combine a summer school program to see if we can save some cost? Or do we do it with Cromwell? Do we do it, you know, who's close to us? Um, I reached out to Meg Walsh, the director there. We're going to get together over the summer because um, Meg, Meg's lit up on the phone. Oh, yeah, I think that's something we could do, but will it be cost benefit? You know, with transportation, staff wise, yes. So Meg and I will hook up over the summer and see if, if that's a way that we can have a cost savings to both towns because I know that's where we are sitting right now. Is so any collaboration wouldn't be this year, it would be correct. next year, if any. Correct, mm -hmm. the following year. So, any questions? any questions? Very nice. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I know that we have textbook adoption up next, but I also see that we have a family sitting here with two little ones. So. Uh, without any objection, I would like to move the healthy foods discussion up one. Do we need to? Uh... <coughs> I don't think we need to do anything. I think we can just swap it around. However, their younger one is going through just about every book in the library, so they may want to keep them on that pace. Some of reading will be like two minutes, and the textbook adoption should be. What's that? The, the summer reading should be about two minutes. What's up next? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Lori. Lori. Lori, would you do summer reading real quick? Yes. We're not going to move things after all. You all should have gotten this in your packet, did you? Yep. Okay, so this has all of the details of what our expectations are at the various grade levels for summer reading. So the purpose of me being here tonight is just to remind you of how important that is in case someone comes up to you on a ball field and says, why are you making my kid read during the summertime? Um, why is that important? So what we know about children and what they gain and what they lose by reading or not reading, students can lose up to three months of reading progress over summer if they do not read. So if we take a look at that and they lose three months this summer and then they get that back during the school year, but then they lose another three months the next summer. So that becomes cumulative. If we don't get kids reading, they're not going to make the progress that we expect them to make. If they do read, kids can gain up to a month. And so just having them read independently is a great thing. So in K-2, if they read 10 to 15 books, 
that's great progress. We expect that they'll maintain what they're doing. In three and above, we're talking all the way through high school, if they read four or five books, we think they're going to be doing what they should be doing in order to um, progress. So what we're doing in the schools, the Latin media specialists and the reading departments at the different schools have gotten together and we've said, all right, Nikki had an author come in and they talked about the um, author that they came in, they talked about summer reading, they have another kickoff, <coughs> so they'll just keep revisiting that whole piece. High school will do that during advisory, and elementary schools, pet library is actually going to come in, and then they're going to do some summer reading um, time on their own. You'll also see in this packet that the library media specialists can plan with the kids to say, hey, so what are you going to read this summer? What are some types of books? Where do you want to read? You know, that type of thing. Because some kids, oh, I'm going to read with my parents. Oh, I, want, I like reading by myself. Whatever works. Um, but what the biggest part is, is just having access to books. So some of the things that we're doing related to that, at the elementary level, we have books that will go home with students. And students self-select their books, so it's all choice. Um, at the middle and high school, they have, they're encouraged to check books out of the middle school library and the high school library and take those home with them for the summertime. And then our public library. So the public library has come in, they've opened, they work with both BB and the high school to get kids library cards and make sure they maintain their library cards. We've got teachers library cards. We've um, talked about how to get books on tape. So really, all access to any kind of reading that could possibly happen during the summer. So our job is just to keep kids reading, and we do that by providing access to books. So hopefully we'll have a lot of kids reading this summer. I know we'll have a lot of adults reading this summer. Thanks, Lori. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Any questions? Thank questions you. for Lori? Thank you. Textbook adoption. So we just had one book that was approved by the Student Achievement Committee earlier tonight. It's a text for honors geometry a book. Um, Mrs. Thurston, the math department chair, can present it to the subcommittee who uh, supported her recommendation and asks that you move forward with support. Okay. I move to adopt the textbook, Big Ideas Math, a Common Core Curriculum Geometry First Edition by Larson and published by Cengage Learning, copyright 2019. Motion by Tim. I'll second. Second by Jamie. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And now we'll get to the health and foods discussion. Uh, so uh, May 13th board meeting, um, we asked Superintendent Benigni to um, look into some sample policies for us for further discussion, uh, you each have um, copies of those two um, policies. One is a 100%, if you will, restricted peanut tree nut free policy, and the second is a limited policy. Um, and this is obviously all. Um, revolves around student safety and opportunities for, for students to be inclusive. Um, as I said at the last meeting, I am in favor of the um, fully restrictive policy. I think it makes things kind of quick and easy. Is It's simply not allowed and that's the way it is. Uh, but this is a discussion, so I open it up to the board for comments, questions. <coughs> Brian, go ahead. Thanks. Just a little bit, of, just, just a little bit of thought on the process here. So we'd have a discussion tonight at our next board meeting on June tenth. Would be I would take the, whatever we decide on the policy, take these back, redraft them, clean them up, um, and then would come back as a first reading for a policy on the June tenth, and then possible adoption in July. Brian, if you also just give a little background as to where these two. So we uh, look versions. sure we we looked at um, about five other districts and what they had for their policies, and then um, did some editing. Um, our policies most closely align with Newington's, 
uh, Newington seem to have the closest policy. Their, their policy is really policy one um, with a few um, edits um, to it. And then policy two is what we spoke of at the last meeting where it was changes from our current policy but not totally um, eliminating um, all uh, peanut and tree nut items. So um, I guess my, my initial question is, you know, I'm looking at both of these policies and I understand, um, you know, Matt's position of, you know, a clean piece, but I think the clean piece that we were talking about before was the idea of no food for the birthday celebrations. Um, when I'm looking at sample one, if I'm reading this right, so even in a classroom where there is no student that has any nut or peanut allergy, a student would not be able to have a snack um, that has any peanuts in it. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious where that comes from. I mean, certainly there's students that may have other allergies or other restrictions and sometimes, you know, if there's, I'm trying to understand the harm of a classroom that there's no cases of peanut allergies in the classroom. I certainly understand the other parts. The thought behind it is simply that if students switch, change classrooms or change that the, the the oils could be on the desk or table if they're not wiped properly. So if the students are switching, it's not just in that classroom. Um, say they're switching for a science class or a group activity or something. That that was some of the concern of why it was all classrooms. And just being, we did the modification that was made is the pre-K-5. Um, that was something that I changed to pre-K-5. That it would not be at the middle school level, it would just be pre-K-5. So uh, in pre-K-5, are there situations where the kids are changing classrooms? There, there, there is. It's limited, but there is such as, you know, um, when they do their intervention block, uh -huh. there's changes. There are changes that, you know, two classes could get together for something. You just don't know. Um, so that being the, the most stringent, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, what's allowed. Well, the upper grades of pre-K-5 move from classroom to classroom to start right, with their maths or their sciences. Absolutely. Certainly specials. Um, I guess the other possibility could be that a, you know, an, an environmental problem causes us to have to move everybody out of the classroom, you know, a flood or a pipe burst or something. And then you wind up putting kids in a classroom that you weren't anticipating having to put them into. I don't mind that necessarily. Um, the only thing that I'd be concerned about, just knowing parents, you, that will bottle probably. But um, to make sure that the teachers, I know you have this in here, but it says here on the second point, they will not be allowed to eat the snack. So if they brought in a pack of almonds, because that's their protein choice, they will not be allowed to eat. It's so harsh. Will the, will the teacher have crackers or something there? Because you, don't, you can't tell a student they cannot eat a snack. So will the teachers have like goldfish or something for that situation? You really want to try to get away from the teachers initiating or I giving snacks because you just don't know. Now the teacher has a list of what students are allergic to, but you don't know that's the case. So that's why, and it doesn't have to be at this level. It can be anywhere in between. That's why I drafted, you know, two, like this is the, 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 the most stringent level. So if there's changes we want to make within that, no, but I think Tracy's point is a good one. If a kid comes in with a bag of almonds because that's what they want or the parent just wasn't thinking that day. But it's not the child's fault. And the yeah, child yeah. is then caught by the teacher and said, no, you can't eat these. Right. Well, the we, kid goes home. Well, it's the same thing at lunch, though. I mean, if a student doesn't have money for lunch or forgets their lunch, we make sure that they eat a that's lunch. That's what I make sure. Right. Right. How do right. We but we're, 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 we're just not serving anything that's true or not, right? So it's, a, a, you know, even if a student forgets their lunch several times and they no longer can be provided with, you know, a choice of their hot lunch, then it's a sun butter sandwich is what they used to get, but it's not a peanut butter sandwich. Um, so. so let me ask you that, that question. So my son took peanut butter to school every single day for that was his sandwich from home. Does that mean that he won't be able to do that no, in this policy? No, because we're, we're only talking so in the classroom. Because okay. they have to actually wash their hands yeah. as soon as they're going to eat it. And we still would have the ta you know, we still would have a table that would you know, that students would know that if they're allergic that they would not be at the table with that. So they could have their peanut butter or whatever they wanted for lunch. It's just in the classroom. In the cafeteria, 
cells, chip bags, or things that are approved if yes. the child needs. Yes, yeah, so if we could get them a snack, that's not a pro yes, we would. But we want, you know, if we if we have to, yes. But we want we want to deter that. We want to deter that. It's okay. You know, I have a snack here for those students who need it, and then it potentially. If it was an okay, issue, so yeah, yeah, we're not gonna let we're not gonna let anyone, you know, okay, no, yes. absolutely not, no, no. And same thing goes for lunch. We're not gonna let anyone go hungry. So, and just for the for the board and the people here, and if anybody's out there watching it, if you see me on the phone, it's because people are sending me updates the about the referendum. There is no yes. results yet, but I asked them to right. to send it to me when it came along. So, it's not that I'm being rude. It's I'm trying to pay attention to the referendum at the same time. Sorry to interrupt the discussion because it's good. So the next one, snacks used in classroom lessons. That's a big one that is that going to be across the. Is this just K through five, pre K through five, or is this across the board? No, it'd be it'd be pre K five. Okay, because I know people reward teachers with starburst or something like that, so that will not be allowed. Anymore. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. They, they, shouldn't, shouldn't they should not be doing that. According to healthy foods, they shouldn't reward. Healthy That's not our healthy foods. foods. They shouldn't reward with Starburst or any type of NSLP candy. Program, any type so of food, right? They shouldn't be doing they shouldn't that. They shouldn't be. All. That's in our policy. So. So for celebrations, like all three of the schools do a fifth grade celebration. I know some are on site and some are off site. So. Like what we did this year at Willard is we're actually purchasing food from the cafeteria and then providing a pizza for those that can't or whatnot. But that would change how we would do a celebration such as that if we, which I, believe me, I, I mean, I don't like this sample too, but you can see some, I don't like that at all. I like this where we don't have that available, but if we're having those sort of celebrations, to the great party or whatnot, um, Things. Anything you could, anything and that's, yes. If you do, if you get the allergy or allergy, whatever, from, if, let's say you wanted to order a pizza or whatever, from a restaurant or bills or wherever, you could do so if it was, um, had, you know, like, I was kind of confused as to. Looks like you need two weeks, you at like least two, two weeks, weeks but prior. As long as you get the list of what ingredients. And it goes to the nurse. And it goes to the nurse. That could still be provided. The only, the only thing we need to be cleaned up here is the birthdays may be acknowledged with non-food items. If we're saying in number one, it really should be birthdays can only be acknowledged with non-food items. We're yes. saying, right. So it's just can only be, so it's, or must be. So then the school-wide <coughs> events, no peanut products at all. And then if there's other sorts of allergies, to be obviously aware of that. And well, we, we probably would add sesame to this too, after the fact. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if the if the item is coming from our cafeteria, we're saying that it's you safe. Bring any, I would like it to say, I think what I'm trying to say is that no item should be from any homemade item, which we have up here, but to make sure that in any um, okay. school-wide event, that if something is going to be um, Provided that's not purchased from the cafeteria, then it would need to be from. Well, that's like, prepackaged right here. Prepackaged yeah. and clearly labeled with allergens. Science so posted. <coughs> right. Okay. So, so two caveats here. We got like our fifth grade party. We absolutely have to have the outside, but we ask parents to fill out in the beginning of the year all your allergies, everything you have, and we discuss where you order food outside. So, like, let's say we get Bell's pizza or whatever. It is discussed and everything is looked at and parents are aware of where we're going, what we're doing, and if there's any special needs, they work it out and we take care of it. Is that we're not allowed to do that anymore. That's what I might I'm just looking I'm just making sure the cuts your hopefully. Because we'll pay for it. Like we, let's say we had a gluten free. We make sure there's enough gluten free. Yeah, but you're, you're providing alternative food must be provided for students with food allergies other than medically documented food related conditions. So I think I so think so yeah. regular regular yeah, Bill's I, pizza. Yeah, you're fine with that. But this doesn't necessarily address the issue of a student based on an allergy being separated completely from the rest of the class. 
which was also something that we were trying to address in this. Number one eliminates it. Number Correct. Number two. I guess, so I guess district wide events become a little bit so different than the classroom, but that is something that we were also trying to address. So I think if in the. think of the picture of this young man here sitting by himself because somebody wants to go get a right. cupcake. But I think in the classroom, by saying that they must be, then I think that eliminates it, right? So it's classic, birthday the birthday celebrations. Those won't be taking place in the cafe anymore, so that part, no food. no food. So when you go to the cafeteria, you're still gonna need the table, but I think the question is now you're not having that cupcake or someone's bringing the cupcakes to have and someone's sitting in isolation. Right. So that takes care of that portion. Mm -hmm. The other part it doesn't take care of if, you know, a student doesn't have hot lunch or something, doesn't have hot lunch, then a student, if a student can only bring two friends or whatever, I think that's something that's, that's an internal practice, it's not really a policy, that more than students can sit there than just two. But it's still gonna be, if everyone brought cold lunch in and the student with the food allergies has to sit at that table, there still could be some isolation there. But that is a safety issue and a safety measure that would need to take place. Because if a student is bringing in that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we don't want them at that table because it's a safety Agreed. risk. So that, that part, I think, is going to have to stay in place to some degree within the cafeteria, and I think it has to in order for safety. And I know a multitude of districts that do it that way, but I think there's a cognizant awareness of you're not gonna bring in, you're not gonna have someone come with a tray of cupcakes and students are gonna just gonna like a vacuum, just leave the student. That You're gonna eliminate that. So I, I, I'm in agreement with, I mean, Jamie, that for me, it's sample number one is the way to go. With that said, it's also significantly, str this, this is a significantly stronger policy than we currently have in place. And as with all of our policies, as Tim knows, is we review them annually. And this is one that we would probably have to put to the top of the list to keep on top of as yes. things continuously change. So I think what Brian and I was asking for is which of the two policies do we want him to move forward to go through final cleanup through our our legal counsel to put into an official policy format? Absolutely. Just say no. Which is the more strict? I, I agree with sample one. Tim? I think one, my only question would be do we generalize it away from peanut slash tree nut free to the eight known allergens or whatever CDC list that we could reference so that if a ninth shows up, the policy is not something that I have to look at every four months and read about. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I was going to bring up the, the spirit of the policy committee that's going to be doing some work after the budget's done today. Um, <coughs> Jake? Um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm Googling the you no know, analogies, and, 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 the, and the reason I am because I, I'm not educated enough to know. I, I know with peanut allergy, I mean, there are situations where the smell of it can right. make someone nauseous or make someone sick. I don't know about the other eight allergies. Um, if there's other allergies that perhaps don't, you know, it's not the smell. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly, you know, I'm looking at. Other things here about you know gluten. I know if I have a gluten allergy. If gluten's in the room, I'm okay. Um, it's not as severe, so I, I don't know. Fair. Mr. Ryan. I'm okay with sample number one. Okay. So Brian, I think that we move sample number one forward, but we do need some clarification on the severity of the eight other allergens. But I think that they need to be addressed in some way in our policy. But I think to Jake's point, but your severity may be different than anybody else's. So I think we just need to get a line on, on what that means and what it looks like. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on the food policy? Okay. I, I know it's 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 not in the uh, the list, but I don't know if it's proper to maybe ask any comments from uh, patient people in the 
<laughs> here. You know what? It's only fair. Would you like to, any comments or questions? Or uh, well, my one thing is thank you. Uh, this has been years of, of hope to get this point, and I'm thrilled I'm Brian shared with me a little bit of policy one. I was hoping that you guys would go for it. Uh, so we will feel thrilled to hear you all. Um, and I agree, you know, considering all the other outcomes is important. I can tell you, um, just from my own personal experience, it's typically the oil, the aroma that goes into the atmosphere, and it can get green in that will cause the antioxidants and the nuts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's oil based. So not disease can have that reaction, but typically not there. I love hearing sesame too, since he's allergic to it, and they are trying to push that to be the ninth common allergen. It's so common. Um, it's not currently, it doesn't have to be called out in the food. It's just really scary for us. So, um, so yeah, we're excited. Yes, thank you very much. We thank you for your, we thank you for your diligence and apologize for the frustrations that come with that. Well, it was, I'm just grateful we got here. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. <laughs> no, you don't even have to be quiet. <laughs> it sounds like the rain stops, so that's a good time. Okay, uh, Brian. Uh, it says choice student update, but I'm assuming, assuming it should say student choice update. But choice student update. All right. So, now, I know there's been a bunch of discussion about the choice students, and so I prepared a, a one-page document for you. So what you have in front of you is the enrollment. Rich, if you could get <laughs> So now Jamie's got them all. After discussions with uh, several uh, board members and some members of the public, I just thought it was nice to have a one clean sheet to get an understanding of where our student population is as well as the student population of choice, the choice to population where um, that are special education students, that was a discussion. I just want to remind the board that when we have special education expenses that exceed the $8,000, those are 100% reimbursed by Hartford. So if we have a student that's out of place that is choice, we do, the $8,000 is deducted, but then that student, the full out placement is covered by Hartford. If they're receiving services, in district through our staff, OT, PT, those services are billed to Hartford above 8,000 also. One-to-one -one pair professionals. One-to-one pair professionals. If it's, if it's IEP for a student, then those are paid also. So when you look at these costs, these are actually students for the integrity of the students. Obviously, it lists what grade levels, but you can look at some of the costs that we're paying. And the ones that you're seeing that are under $60,000, those are not outplacements, those are internal costs. Um, and you can see the students where there is an outplacement at each, totaling up to $563,000 that is billed to Hartford annually um, that we are reimbursed for the special education cost. Yes, the 39% of the students that we currently have in choice, 50 students out of 127, are special education students. Um, that is three times um, the Berlin students that reside in Berlin population for special ed, so it is much higher. Um, the thought, though, moving forward, um, looking at this year, um, only 14 students moving into the district, one at seventh grade and then the rest at the uh, kindergarten level. Um, it, it, the, I believe that the ratios will be different with the students starting at that level. Um, as you can see at the first column there for K, um, we're looking at two out of nine students that are special education. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions. Um, five, six, seven, and eight. Yes, the middle school has five, six, seven, the highest level. Yes. Yeah. But the middle school in general has the highest percentage. Anyone that's special ed, let's be, yes. Yes, yep. Anyone that's special ed, yep. Diagnosis, yes. <coughs> Questions so for Brian on this? Only 39% of our choice students receive services. 39% 39, 39 
are identified as special education. I think that would be probably important for people to know. I think we think it's a lot higher. Yeah, well, that's, that's why. And, and there's, that's 50 students. Right. Out of, out of 127 that we currently Thank have. You for doing that. No problem. I think it's good data to look at. I think it, I think it also is good to track annually what grade levels. Um, as I said, looking at the model we're looking at, taking students at the K level, we'll see how this, the trend and see what number. So I think it'll be an annual report to the board at this time and you'll see, you know, year to year, we'll get each year and see how things move. So. Can I just raise a point of caution sharing this information because since in some of the grades there's only one mm -hmm. student who receives special education services and one choice student, if you share that publicly, you're publicly identifying that particular open choice kid as, oh, right. I so I just want to. Like, I think people think it's like 70 or 75. Yeah. And they're thinking that less money and less. Well, this is reflective of students who receive special education services, mm -hmm. not of reading support or math support or other yeah, services well, that well, yeah, well, are available to take. What Aaron's them. saying is it, it's descriptive if you share that. If someone knew who that one choice student was in and, and one school and it's one label, they could distinguish yeah. who. Yeah. That's why the numbers at the bottom, yeah. I, I, I grouped them as elementary, so you don't know which students are special education within the group or what their disability is to try to, um, so. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, next up is the budget discussion. And as of, uh, let's see, two minutes ago, we still do not have results of the referendum out there. So what I thought made most sense is essentially to go, you know, put publicly on record that that I shared with you, which is a summary of uh, the last town council meeting that uh, Brian and I had the <coughs> honor to, but joy is a good word, to attend. Um, I, I will start with with the, um, the mayor kind of cornered Brian and I at the very beginning, um, about five or six minutes before the meeting was supposed to start. That would have something to do with me arriving there about five or six minutes before it started. Um, and he wanted, in essence, approval to reduce our budget um, from the $500,000. And I was not going to back down. Um, there is conversation that has taken place about our ability to pay ESS out of this year's budget, or does it need to be paid out of the, the year in which the services reside? So past practice would be that we have paid ESS out of the previous year's leftover money for the, for the forthcoming year. We have heard mixed um, opinions on whether that is okay or not. Um, we have uh, Jerry Paradis on the Board of Finance who said that that is not an allowable practice. He is a, he's a well-respected auditor. He does town audits and Board of Education audits, you know, as that was his job. Um, Brian had a conversation with the Assistant Superintendent of Finance over uh, in Meriden. He said, mm, not really an allowable practice. Uh, I had conversations with a couple of other districts and they said the same. Um, we've heard through our own interim business manager that it was allowable as long as you only do it once within a contract year or a, a fiscal year. There's only one payment within the year. Um, attorney. Uh, our attorney said it's a gray area. It's up to, let's say there's no surprise there, but it's up to uh, the auditor that is, that is providing the audit services. Some will say that it's acceptable, some that will say that it's not. Um, but the bottom line is, is that five minutes to seven, the mayor got approval from, our, from Kevin Delaney and saying, yes, we can do that, it's okay, so can I reduce your budget? And I said, no, unless I have something in writing that will direct our business manager to allow that, I cannot in good conscience allow us to do a continuum practice that may not be acceptable. So if you can provide me documentation from an authority that says it's okay, 
then yes, we can have this conversation. Otherwise, no. In the five hundred thousand dollars now is ESS, and is the is the athletics that we've talked about. Unfortunately, those decisions mean that we will not be reinstating any positions, which is not what I want to be saying. But that's the trade-off. So, um, in the end, uh, it would be safe to say that uh, Mayor Kaczynski wasn't happy with me. But in the end, is he did not reduce our five hundred thousand um, dollar reinstatement of funds from the Board of Finance. Um, what he did do, and we did agree to, was he took the $95,000 for the uh, phones out of the budget. So because that was on the town side, in capital, he took that, he, he cut that completely, but with our agreement that we would, we would fund that out of this year's end of the year funds. We, we have that and we can do it. Uh, hold on, I know. Everything passed. Town budget and the school board budget passed tonight, according to that text right there. So that's good news. Um, so now the rest of this conversation is moot, uh, <laughs> other than um, I just want you to know what was taken back so that we know where it is. Um, the security was released an additional $100,000 uh, with the agreement that the Board of Education would pay for the four security people's um, firearm, vest, radios, uniforms, and any other equipment. We estimate that to be somewhere around ten or twelve thousand dollars that we paid that out at the end of this year's funds. They took that out of the town side. That he made a hundred thousand dollars cut because we started doing the salary, which is people only. Three security, three security guards, one director, roughly two hundred thousand dollars. That stayed, he took 100, we were at 300. Um, so when you add that up, along with uh, a $25,000 cut on the town side here, and the $178,000 that the Board of Finance had already reduced, um, he was looking to offside, offset the 500,000 so that it, that there wasn't a, a, a budgetary increase in the mill. and a mill rate increase. Uh, he was able to get to within about $100,000 of that. Um, but it was a difficult conversation, but one that needed to be had. Um, and in the end, the town people supported us, so. Um, if we were planning initially to fund ESS for next year out of leftover funds from this year, that was our initial plan, and we're no longer gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Was there any promise or guarantee made to the mayor that we would turn that money back over to the town at the end of the year? I know we have to pay 95000 for the phones out of that money. There, I'm assuming that's where it's coming from. There was not any promise to give money back to the town. Um, and in fact, I was pretty straightforward that we would, we would most likely fund as many of the capital projects right. that we could with this money at the end of this year, since they gave us zero capital right. in the budget last year. Good. So, um, and that went kind of without saying, like, that that just was a, kind of a, a yep. That's what you're going to do. So good. Questions on from a security perspective, we're at three plus a director. Three plus a director. Uh, so the director, um, the three would go to the elementaries, and we would still have SROs at the high school, and until the police budget is squeezed. Until right. Um, not, not what we were looking for. Obviously, I think we were somewhere at six plus the director, so we were looking for six security folks plus the director. We wanted two at the high school, um, one at each of the other schools, and the director, I think, is how we got to six plus. Um, but it, frankly, it's a start. So, Brian? We're at, that's, that gives us, that's a 3.2% budget increase or 1.4 million as compared to last year's budget. Um, gives us 44 million, my number here, which I think is correct, 44 million, 977,000, dollars budget versus, so it's a 1.4 million increase as compared to last year, um, to the operational, which is, that's the largest increase we've seen in the last six, six years. I, I have a question, yep. and I could have missed it, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to, so $500,000 we got back, yep. we're bringing ESS 
DSS right. and sports. Hundred thousand dollars for middle school sports, fifty thousand dollars for uh, the freshman sports, and there's fifty thousand dollars worth of stipends that we talked about. Most of which were attached to all of the sports okay. going through. So we got a lot of that we get to. Now, some of the about. backlash we've been getting is that we're not reinstating anybody. That was not that. Correct. And they, I don't know, people have came up to me a few times. Uh, wanting yep. sports to be gone, well not gone, but pay to play and get that. Um, do we have a point on that? Because I think that's something that's going to come up or... So, I, regarding pay to play, uh, pay to play to participate, thank you. Um, I think that personally, I think that at some point we're going to need to enact and implement something. The superintendent talked very strongly about why not to. Um, I also would say that pay to participate to make up 200 plus thousand dollars is asking a lot of each of the individual athletes along the way. Um, when you start that, and that's just for the middle school and the freshman portion, that doesn't include the other million dollars that we have, we're not talking about right now. Um, so I, I think that at some point, we're going to have to get there. The fact that we are not, um, bringing back any positions is part of the difficult decision that the Board of Education has to make based on what's going on at the time. And I know that everybody's got their own agendas and what they think is important. We have to look at it from a much higher level. And we're working off of the recommendations of the superintendent who says that he can't absorb sort of that. The, the reductions that he has recommended to us are reductions that he can work within. So I think that we need to honor that. And, and we know ESS is important. We know the athletics is important. We know this, the, they're all important. Everything's important. So, so for the assistant principal position at the middle school, is it the same as you Well, the, the, there's many issues. There's many. There's many issues at McGee without a second assistant principal. Um, one of them is the PPTs and the 504s, all the yeah. management. That would have to be redistributed um, within the district of who's responsible for all those. Because you know, you'll you could have uh, you can have four PPTs in a day, and that essentially is your day. Other than you know, greeting the students off the bus and, and staff observation. And that that we can, that will have to restructure within the district with other other administrators stepping in. Discipline, discipline, discipline will still be done by the discipline. principal and assistant principal. Yes, to me. So that's that is done. Well, it's just a matter of whether we can find funds and what funds are available to to, to work that position and any other position, okay. you know. Um. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, you know, echo. I mean, I think. Our biggest concern is really at the middle school and how to deal with behavioral issues um, without the, the support. Um, you know, I mean, another thing is, you know, I, I know the the capital funding um, was not ideal this year. Um, you know, is there any opportunity to maybe have more cameras or something? Because I, 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 there must be an exorbitant amount of time dealing with the, you know, he said, she said, and he said something else. If the middle school, uh, and I'll make this uh, claim, if the middle school had the camera coverage that the high school had, it would be much different. The high school, you have complete coverage from the time the student gets off the bus to anywhere in the hallway, it's total coverage. Now the middle school, we have a proposed camera coverage that will give the middle school all the coverage that the high school you know, um, has. That, we're looking at, if we're not doing ESS, we're looking at using some of that money to get the camera coverage at the middle school. Absolutely. Okay. And the recording system to do that. That doesn't. That doesn't. That doesn't replace an assistant principal, though. Of I course. mean, but but it definitely gives us from a safety perspective of you know the hallways and coverage and the amount of time investigating things. Um, Matt, from your perspective, are we still open to a conversation about creating an additional revenue stream out of parking? Absolutely. I don't think that's off the table. Okay. I think from, from my perspective, I think that's an easy one. I think it comes down to do we want to do it and at what at what rate is what it comes down to. And it doesn't have to 
I mean, we don't have to start with a crazy rate. It could be as simple as $100 per year. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I know there's a lot of districts that do do that. Um, and I think it's the same conversation that we had with, you know, activity play, pay to participate, whatever it is, is we can talk about it or we can do it. Is, right. is That's where it comes down to. <coughs> so the one downside I see with putting something like that into play is that somebody has to track it all, Yeah. right? So as you downsize administrators and you downsize some support staff, somebody has to track all that. Now in, my, in this particular case, because it's parking passes, I would tell you it's gonna fall to the security director and that's gonna be probably one of his jobs. But that's up to Brian to decide. Yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> well, absolutely. It right? shouldn't so, fall on an administrator as a clerical right. task. So, so, right. uh, but I think that's, that's where, where a lot of those. I mean, I, I, w I will say just in terms of the sports, I mean, I think just, just the, your wording was, I think, very critical. I mean, rather than talk about pay to play or pay to participate, it's really a revenue stream to right. offset or even a targeted tax to those who enjoy the benefits. Um, you know, and at least for the sports, if you look at the systems that are already in place, they're designed to take payment as you enroll in sports. So um, I think the clerical cost would probably be minimal if you were to, again, offset by revenues per stream. So I think we need to continue to have, I think we need to continue to put meat on that bone until we get what we think works. Right. So any other thing about the budget? All right. Uh, so formally, we thank the the voters of Berlin for supporting the Board of Education budget and passing it in the second time around. Um, next up is we have a personnel matter and we need an executive session, so uh, a motion to go to executive. Move to go into executive session to discuss a personnel matter, inviting the superintendent. Motion by Tim, second by Jamie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we are in executive session at 920. <coughs>